What is up, you savages? This is the Protect Your Neck Podcast, and I'm your host, Dan Tom. Analyst is work you can find over at MMA Junkies, as well as OddsCheckerUS.com. But on this year's program, the Protect Your Neck Podcast, we break down high-level MMA. That's what we're going to do here today, tonight, whenever you listen to this. Hopefully it's before the fight. Recording this late Thursday night. Weigh-ins just completed. Uh, we had a late weigh-in. Uh, we'll get to. Uh, a fight pulled. We'll get to. Hopefully nothing else has changed. And that way you will have... Uh, uh, a very up-to-date breakdown here, which I will try to expedite uh, after we recap uh, quickly last week. Uh, check the timestamps for when the UFC 267 breakdown starts from top to bottom as per usual. And as per usual, I'll recap my picks and plays at the very end. If you are even shorter on time or just don't want to hear me, which I can't say I don't blame you. But either way, we're going to try to get through this, hopefully make some money. Uh, could use a, you know, it was a bad week last week. But aside from that, yeah. Luckily, I've been, that's a good thing about being disciplined, even though I feel like I've, I've, I've left money on the table on winning weeks when I finally had a losing week that I was, was, was frankly overdue. Um, it didn't kick my ass too hard. However, I, I would dare say, I think that maybe still, maybe just one more, just one more good week, and uh, your boy here, on a personal note, um, can finally make, at least, you know, for him, uh, w- one of the bigger withdrawals I've made in a minute, which is nice, especially the way, the way this year's been going. So, uh... And especially with uh, Vechechon coming up, uh, you know, again, um, independent contractor here, so i got to make my money where I can. And uh, you boy, just like everyone in the media, I'm, I'm not playing a violin. We're all on the same, but we're all burnt the fuck out, folks. So forgive us, forgive us if we're not as excited as you are. It is a card to get excited about, and I hope we have some fights to enjoy. And again, I hope we all make some money and we all do well. Yes, yes, yes. We, will, we shall get to that. Uh, I'm trying to be negative, Nancy, here. Lots of positives. Lots of things to motivate us. Uh, one way or the other, right? Um, at least that's how I'm trying to look at it, because I could use everything uh, to motivate me right now. But uh, I feel pretty decent about what I've accrued for you. There was 15 fights, so I hate to cut it close, but, you know, your boy here, i got to do my god darn due diligence, and uh, for better or worse... Um, so yeah, I'm going to try to, uh, expedite this. Uh, I'm going to skip all like the current events and the Dana Contender Series stuff, which I, I fucked up last week and I thought it was over. I mentally prepared for it to be. And nope, another three event week next week because there was two more for whatever reason. My dumbass did not write down the last two dates. So yeah, um, uh, yeah. And then of course, uh, you know, we get some nice, uh, nice, uh, nice casual, uh, Racism last week. I'm not going to dive into that. I just want to put this as a reminder. And I felt like my, my followers were going up on Twitter. I'm like, this can't be good. I think that, I think that uh, you know, um, sure enough, I had, you know, you just share some stuff about, you know, um, you know, marginalized groups, black lives, what have you. And you watch your follower count go back down in MMA. And all's right in the world. Because... <laughs> That just seems to be the space we exist in. So all, all, my only note I'll say for that, as we'll push on uh, all analysis here, I promise. Just want to just just a reminder for those of you who are, who might be new to the potty, as uh, the numbers have been jumping in the, few, in the last few weeks, which I appreciate by the way. Appreciate y'all being here. But just a reminder, this is an anti-racist, anti-hate space. Um, so uh, any of the phobias, uh, xenophobia, transphobia, any of that shit, not welcome here. Not welcome on my timeline. Uh, other than that. If you're a degenerate fight fan, you're a degenerate gambler. Um, you like have fun. You're a decent person. You just you know want to make some dirty jokes. Whatever. You're welcome. Talk shit about me, fucking all day. You're welcome. Do all that stuff here. That's fine. Uh, just just leave the fucking targeting marginalized groups and hate. There's just too much in that uh, in the world, and that that's that's it. Easy, right? It's not not political. Just don't. You know, my man Ant Walker said, just don't be a bit bi- don't be a bigoted piece of shit. That's it. All right, on with the show. Love that. Um, shout, shouts to everybody for the love and support on a positive. I've been getting a lot of love and support. Uh, don't let that negative take. You know, I just had to get that. You know, default message. But really, it's been it's been a lot of positivity despite the craziness that exists in the world and in all our lives. Surely, um, right? Uh, and uh, but there's 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 just been a lot, man. Um, you know, uh, whether it's you guys uh, sharing my breakdowns, um, you know, the kind words, you know. Uh, you know, f- f- from the uh, from my fellow degenerate gamblers and podcasters, uh, MMA guru TB Scouting over there at uh, Chronic Combat Conversations. Hey, cr- uh, Combat Chronicles. Everything kind of runs into each other. Shout out to my man Kyle. Um, uh, 
uh, always a good dude. Uh, and, and and those from the uh, the fight side have man uh, John Anik, of course, on the broadcast. Uh, give some love to my breakdown today, which was nice for the co-main event. Jan Sanhagen, which we'll talk to, as well as uh, Ann Evans. Uh, giving some love to my main event breakdown. I don't know where the hell that comes from, but um, but fuck do I appreciate it. I don't, I'm still grappling with whether I, I deserve any of this shit because I'm just, to, to be honest, just kind of too burnt to, to process. But I am trying to process the positive, as we tend to not do. We always tend to, we always tend to stick with the negative. So I really want to just take a time to acknowledge the positive and you guys. I appreciate you guys. So, again, just the you know the anti-racist reminder off the top, uh, but but an overall appreciation because I know I've already weeded out. You know, uh, if you're listening to this, you're, you're this far. You're, you know, me. God, I, first of all, what the fuck's wrong with you? Second of all, you know, thank you. You're probably uh, you know, you know, you're probably not who. Uh, I'm talking about as the negative, but as the positive, I embrace that shit. So thank you guys. All right, uh, UFC last week recapped. Uh, or six fifty two. Um, oh wait, it was bad. What well, nine four and one in picks? So it was really bad considering we actually didn't do that bad in picks. But you know, picks, plays, and analysis are all different things in this game, as I say all the time. Uh, because we went o one and one in a straight place. Uh, there was a draw there, which I felt a bit justified on, at least. We'll get to that. Um, the parlay was already falling apart before a fight card. We already lost a leg, and then with a cancellation. And then, um, uh, another, then another leg fell apart in fight. So we'll, uh, we'll get to that, too, real quickly. And we went 0-2 in props, uh, slash 1-3 in props, if you include the ads, because I did a, added a greasy, uh, Fedor Tim Johnson under, minus 150, which I did tweet. Um, and talk to you some about as well. So I did both privately and publicly and all that. But um, and that helped take some of the blow off what was a losing night. Um, but yeah, the UFC just uh, did not do well. Um, yeah, didn't did not did not do well there. Uh, so um, let's go to that real quick. It was uh, Marvin Vittori versus Paulo Costa. Um. You know, I guess you could say I should have bet, you know, what my official pick it was, uh, Vittori by decision. But Vittori went, not just went from underdog to favorite. He got even more juice by the time the weight shenanigans happened, um, which also threw me off. So I actually sprinkled on three, four, and five, um, which of those would have hit would have saved my night too. But they didn't. And decision, uh, you know, I think you're getting plus money, but it's probably like only like a plus 120 or some shit. And I didn't feel like laying that much to make back at that point, you know. Already being down, I wanted more longer shot stuff like those round props. Which I tweeted uh, that I added those as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, Paulo put up a fight. I didn't think he was going to make it out of the first round. Then I, I don't know, he just had that weird gas tank that like it kept going. Um... So, yeah, that was kind of crap, though, like the way, you know, he, he played it. And I kind of, you know, I was kind of telling you guys that it seemed like, you know, the word on the ground is it didn't seem like he was going to even, he, he came in with the intent to cut weight. So, again, there's a lot of flags there. So, you know, can't beat myself too hard for not uh, for not really, you know, leaning into Vittori. Um, even though it would have been right to do so. Uh, Grant Dawson uh, versus Rick Glenn was a draw. Uh, I was on an absolute island, you know, borderline being laughed at for that pick. You know what I'm saying? And you picked, which was tends to happen when you pick and play the the, the biggest dog on the card to, to certain extents. Um, but I dare say, and shouts to Connor Rebush, who uh, you know, uh, and shouts to Zane Simon as well, who I filled in for on the Vivi this week. Really kind of them to extend that. Although again, it's kind of, you know, like I was joking, it's like Armageddon. There's only there's only so many of us degenerates around that can, that can uh, do this kind of a job at a moment's notice. Uh, but no, uh, seriously, I. Uh, uh, I can't take full credit, uh, c c you know, or credit alone, I should say, because uh, Connor had similar reads going in, you know, as well. And, uh, you know, of course, me and Connor both are kind of contrarian, like our weird dudes. But no, we actually could show the work behind our um, weird opinions. Uh, and uh, and I think a lot of that work was shown, you know, um, the improved wrestling, uh, the fact that time off and, the uh, you know, getting the nagging hip issues and other things that was bothering Glenn actually fixed you know, it would actually be a good thing for a guy with his experience, right? 
um, and that showed. And we all knew Glenn was going to lose round one. And round two, there looked like a point where he almost could have turned it around. There was a crucial uh, exchange where Dawson ended up getting on top. Um, but uh, by the way, in that round two, there's a point where Rick uh, Grant Dawson was this close to almost getting, uh, you know, Marlon Marais, Aljamain Sterling, Josh Koscheck, Drew Ficketed, uh, those uh, those kick KOs that, with the, with the knee, you know, uh, that turn into knee KOs, those really devastating ones where they they duck into it. And Grant Dawson, like, I swear he's almost eaten, like, fucking three or four of these in the UFC. And another one happened with Rick Glenn. So I just, I felt really vindicated, even though it was a push. Of course, if Rick Glenn would have won, that would have just pushed us over to our winning night. Again, at the odds he was at. Um, and uh, he arguably did win because, uh, well, in the streets, uh, he kicked, you know, or, or by damage, he, he did all the damage because Dawson didn't do any damage with his positions um and uh rick glenn arguably had him choked out and or and or knocked out because he had him stunned and probably could have finished him if he kept punching but then went for the choke wrapped it up and then you know uh reminded me shots of my guy ryan gator when it was uh, extreme gator 10th planet back in the amateur days and uh was it sean bolander i, f- I think it was uh when he edited bravo's black belts had had ryan in a triangle and you know, I'm backing my guy Ryan to this day, but Ryan's fucking out. <laughs> they just helped him to his corner, and he just like fought like a, I think he just like zombie through round three and ended up getting a greasy ass decision. <laughs> Tenth Planet was so pissed, it was so good. <laughs> so you know, maybe it's a little karma from way back then. Although I'm fucking mad. I don't even know if you could bet those things. I, I sure shit that it. You know, I don't know. Whatever it is. But uh, I, I'll take it, you know, because uh, the analysis was right, god damn it. And um, anybody laughing at that pick, you know? Uh, I, I, again, man, I'm not saying I'm always right. I'm not saying you're going to follow me off a cliff. I'm not saying I'm Nostra fucking Damas. But I show my work and I say things for a reason. So there's that. Jessica Rose Clark defeated Jocelyn Edwards. Uh, went pretty much as expected. You know, you just kind of have to look at Jessica Rose Clark's Instagram and her last fight to see the wrestling emphasis. Um, and, uh, yeah, that went well, although, she, you know, she got lucky. Um, you know, she wasn't facing a Rick Glenn with experience because, again, it was a similar aspect where you sold out for control. Um, and, and granted, Jocelyn Edwards is explosive, so there's a lot we don't see there. It's really hard to ride that line. You know, people are like, why didn't Rick Glenn punch harder? It's like, well, it's really tough, especially with someone who can grapple. I mean, every, look how big of a favorite Grant Dawson is. Grappling's his specialty. And he couldn't even get any strikes or any really meaningful offense on Glenn. Um, and Glenn was almost able to finish the fight. So, you know, not to get back to that fight. But, again, it's it's harder than it looks in these fighters' defenses. That being said, um, this game plan could have, could have just as easily backfired on Rose Clark as well. Thankfully, it didn't. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of wish I played her straight up. Uh, Alex Caceres defeated Sungwoo Choi. Who the hell did I play straight anyways? Did I play anybody straight? Oh, yeah. Fucking Ike. God damn it. That's a bad play. <laughs> um... Alex Caveras, oh yeah, speaking of bad play, there's a parlay leg for me and everybody that went down, right? Sung Woo Choi, oof. Um, classic. Shouts to Connor Rebush again, talking about him pushing into the clinch, which ended up being enough, you know? Uh, Alex Caceres didn't have the wrestling to get him down, but he didn't end up needing to. Um, played spoiler again, you gotta give him a step up. That's like five in a row for Caceres. Um, and a big step down for Choi. Uh, really gotta address that weakness, um, as we all gotta pump the brakes on him. Francisco Trinaldo defeated Dwight Grant. Um, you know, maybe Francisco Trinaldo, older Trinaldo, but I probably should have played him even though that was the pick. And I was kind of hoping he'd go down to plus money or at least near even. He didn't. And uh, But, yeah, um, that was kind of the, the, the dynamic. Dwight Grant couldn't push a, uh, enough of a, a pace to tire him out. Uh, Nikolai uh, Negamarianu defeated Ike Villanueva. Um it was there was back of the headshots for sure, but at the same time, it's like, uh, it's not you know. I'm not surprised that I would have lost that. I, I probably would have ended up losing that bet one way or another, anyways. Um, the annoying part was though is that again, 
the danger of picking bad guy versus bad guy, I'm going to pick worst bad guy because you're still, at the end of the day, picking a bad guy, which is my mistake, clearly. However, in my defense, I feel like this is going to be an investment. And if you follow me off this cliff, hopefully you can think of it this way too, is that for what it's worth, my analysis on Nikolai Nikomarian is still right. He still hasn't done one goddamn thing that's impressive. He just looks the part and is a bit athletic early in fights. And, or not athletic. Has enough power early in fights um, to do things, uh, but like basic ugly punches. But his head move, he moves in straight lines forward and backward. His head doesn't move at all in those straight lines as it's upright. I mean, this guy is just asking for it. I know he's durable, but there's no fucking skill jump there. Um, he was back in Romania for this camp, didn't look to be going to any of the American camps. Like uh, He sprinkled in, I believe, a little bit before in a prior camp. But yeah, man. Um, I'm going to be a little more careful. I'm not just going to insta-do it, even though you, you, you do want to fade him sooner or later because he's young enough in an, in a division where you're allowed to age where, God forbid, he can get better. Um, but from what I'm seeing now, he's still fucking garbage, hot garbage. So uh, I'm going to be careful who it is. But if it is, uh, if it's the right matchup, I'm not, put it this way, uh, I'm not going to be as worried about the price. I'm probably going <laughs> to unload if we get the right matchup on him. So I'm going to consider it as an investment, but bad bet on Ike. Uh, Gregory Rodriguez, uh, Hobo Cobb, de defeated Iron Turtle. Um, got this one right. Congrats to those who played and cashed it. I I stayed away. I, I, man, I, I would have been right, though. Again, ugh, again, I stayed away from the wrong ones, right? So I'm not trying to say it like like I'm better. In fact, I'm not better off for it. Uh, but... um. Boy, would I have also um, added to the more gray hairs that I just keep getting, by the way, um, if I would have bet this fight. Uh, again, Hobo Cop, of course. Uh, there was the joke on the... Uh, I think I said here before, too, and on the vivisection, uh, which was... Uh, he is uh, Bolsonaro's personal personal guard cleaning up the streets of Sao Paulo. <laughs> I forget someone was like... The shots I retweeted him, they were like, yeah, Hobo Cop definitely looks like a Bolsonaro... <laughs> A Bolsonaro a favela initiative. <laughs> He's part of one. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Someone else is like, yeah, Hobo Cop goes town to town racially profiling people in need of help. <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> Hobo Cop. Uh, anyways, and the uh, poor Iron Turtle man. Looked like he was winning this one too. Hobo Cop looked gassed, but, uh, you know, Hobo Cop, man. He's a. Uh, He's packing heat in many ways, I suspect, but uh, he pulls away there. Tabitha Ricci defeated uh, Maria Oliveira. Um, being an Adam's decision, I uh, took a shot on the sub props because I wanted action. I was just like, wait, it's not that's the thing I hate. It's all my action was later in the card. It made me feel like a like a fiending crackhead in the beginning, but also does he leaves you very little time to adjust, which always sucks. Um, and it should have went early. Uh, we'll get to a part of that piece in another one that I miss. Uh, but she tried for the sub, you know. Again, a lot of, a lot of, as they say, variants on this card, you know. Um, not to soften the blow or anything, or try to make. Again, I, I woofed uh, as far as a lot of the, the, uh, the betting, uh, the majority of the betting spots. Let's be honest. But um, it, it felt like uh, <laughs> that was somewhat of a theme. But again, like even a lot of the plays that I was seeing, whether I was on them or, or a lot of them that I wasn't, I was like, that's not a bad play. That almost cashed. And I think there was just a lot of that for everybody. Um, a lot of the reads weren't necessarily wrong. It's just this was a you know a high variance card, as they say, you know, especially with the Mason Jones and David Onama. You know, David Onama had that gas tank too, where he was just like uh, Paulo Costa, where he was always there and dangerous. I didn't expect that, which is why I played Onama round one and Jones round three, uh, rounds two and three. And uh, by my goodness, he tried to finish it a bunch of times, but Onama. You know, with a with one of those performances, which you know, um, me and many in the know would said that th th this could be the case, or his stock would go up in a loss. Excuse me. Uh, even though we were picking him to lose, right? And that it did. The stock definitely went up in a loss. Uh, Jones really got a. I know defense isn't his thing, and I don't want him to like become like a back foot fighter or anything because he's got durability body work pressure and grappling like all those things need to go together just a bit more maybe defensively responsible about how he goes about it and how he pressures more of a guard um not as much of a willingness to just be hit etc and so forth but still big fan of mason jones 
I'm not going to knock him too much if you know his style. It, it shouldn't have surprised you. It just, Onama is just surpri- surprisingly dangerous, even if you were expecting him to be good. So, uh, Jamie Pickett defeated uh, Loriano Staropoli. Good thing I uh, avoided this one. I know Staropoli was big chalk. Um, it was just a, a weird fight. I don't know what, what Staropoli's doing trying to wrestle. And he was like all kickboxing volume at welterweight, and now he's just in all these weird middleweight fights. It's, I don't understand. I want to stay away from him, though. Um, another fight I was on the right side of, but again, just did not want to sweat a crazy striking fight uh, in the first round, at least, which was Jai Herbert versus Kama Worthy, but Herbert, of course, uh, was the one that got the knockout in the um, gunfight. So if you're on the Herbert side, good on you. Jeffrey Molina defeated uh, Daniel Lacerda, which turned into Daniel Da Silva, apparently, the fight of the night, uh, the night of the fight. Uh, Molina, man, looking good. Motor. I always think of uh, Alfred Molina, who's. Uh, oh, I love this part. Dun, 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 dun. From Boogie Nights. Motor. Nah. <laughs> Sister Christian, know your time has come. Oh, uh, yeah. Violent kid. Uh, hard not to like that kid, too. Good, good stuff. That was a solid. That was a really solid parlay piece in hindsight. Uh, Random Marcos defeated Lavinia Souza. Um, stayed away from that one, but congrats to anybody who cashed the Marcos plus money. And uh, Jonathan Martinez uh, defeated uh, Zviad Lavishvili. Um, even though I technically picked Martinez, made me bum me out for not picking my guy there. Just maybe it was the uh, the, the Georgian hype, the last minute shakeup. Martinez. Even though he looked good, which I like that statement, um, you know him him just getting stumbled on the scales recently really made me try to you know overcorrect the steering wheel because you know he's he's definitely you know has been one of my guys for a minute so wanted to make sure I wasn't getting blinded by that bias but no he reinforced and looked good on the scales with the discipline wise so in and out I really like that from Martinez all right a little bit of a lengthy recap twenty two forty eight but we will push on to UFC. The fuck are we on? 267. Yeah. Huh, bye. All right. Um, okay, so it's headlined by Jan Blachowicz, minus 335, versus Glover Deshera, plus 270 for the light heavyweight title. Uh, this and the co-main event I've got in-depth up as we speak over at MMAJunkie.com as per usual. Thanks for sharing those uh, and tagging the love at DanTomMMA on Twitter. Uh, at the PYM Podcast on all social platforms if you want to follow and don't pollute your feed and all that shit and whatever. Uh, and this YouTube, again, with yeah, between my ass not me being able to do normal times, I'm all, like, disheveled and uh, n- no sleep until I get my shit organized. Um, these breakdowns will not be on video until I can just, you know, get normalized. But But they will be coming, folks. Daniel Tom MMA and uh, top fives and everything else is done in actual video there and still up. So thanks for that. Um, but yeah, we got um, this is tough, man. Basically, my heart's with. I'm rooting against like a lot of my picks here, uh, at least in the top two. I ended up going with Chalk here, uh, Blakovich. I just there's just too much there that I I I can't help but see. I got to pick him unbiasedly, but I'm rooting for Glover, and I'm rooting for anybody who's bet Glover. He looked great on the scales. Looks like he came in in great shape, as as you would expect him to. This is his last hurrah. If he can push through the madness, I I think he can um, get to his game, and more importantly, uh, tire Blockowicz out. I know Blockowicz has shown improved cardio, but I do still think that perhaps grappling can... Maybe still tire him. You look that he purposely left it for later rounds against Izzy. Um, despite that being more of an obvious edge, so on and so forth. Um, Teixeira, you know, he's a guy that kind of, you you know, he, 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 he'll he get tired in fights, but he can fight through it and still fight effectively and throw hard kind of a deal. It's more of a body language thing. <clears throat> Um, but, uh, if it becomes a dogfight, obviously that's to share his world. It's just, Blakovich didn't just improve his offensive wrestling. He proved it, proved it defensively. Uh, both these guys did when they were checked kind of by American wrestlers, um, at light heavyweight in the UFC's light heavyweight division. 
Uh, and Blackwood really improved it um, defensively. He's only been taken down once in the last five years. You're going to see people saying, you know, uh, twice in the last five fights or twice in the last five years. This is another reason why stats are fucking bullshit, folks. Um, not only is the, you know, the significant strike stats don't tell the story and all that bullshit that me and everybody else, I feel like we're always screaming at nauseam. But, like, even, like, uh, takedown credits. And I'm not even talking about, like, DC arguing with the statisticians on what's a takedown in MMA statistician uh, by definition compared to his wrestling thing. And they end up always kind of chicken or the egg in it, right? Um, I'm not even talking about those type of scenarios where it's arguable one way or the other. Or maybe not, but seems to be. No, not even those. I'm talking about, like, one of the takedowns that he's credited with. It's in the third round against Tiago Santos. Yeah, you know, the round that doesn't last that long until Blakovic, Blako blitz and gets knocked on his ass and the fight's over. Yeah, they counted that as Blakovic getting taken down. So, realistically, the only takedown he gives is the one takedown he gives in his Nikita Krylov fight, which I believe you go watch that. He's in the middle of throwing a leg kick and Krylov does an explosive shot, which is one of the few things he can do. Uh, or his best, his best thing he can do wrestling-wise. And he's one of the most athletic, big and athletic guys at light heavyweight to do it. And that was like the, yeah, you know, that was the one takedown he's given up in like five years. Um, so again, folks, that's why it's always important to watch the footage. And, you know, maybe not. I, sh I shouldn't say, I mean, how many people fucking make a living off just reading bullshit stats and pretending they know what that means? You know, but hey, you know, who needs to actually go through and watch the footage and do the work? Uh, but if you do do that, uh, you will come up with one takedown seceded for Blakovich. Um, secondly, uh, one of the Blakovich's best things he's always been good at is striking off the brakes. And if you look at a lot of Glover's knockdowns and times he's been rocked, especially as of late, uh, they are in and even out of the brakes. With the Tiago Santos knockdown, uh, I think Roberson gets in there. Cute lava rocks him a bit. Um, so you have a lot of that as well. Uh, another thing that's always been there is uppercuts, you know, from, uh, I think Jones was able to land some, some decent ones. Um, but, uh, obviously Rebel Johnson knocked him out. Uh, I believe with one, um, Gustafson finished him with a bunch of uppercuts. Um, I think Santos on one of the knockdowns, it was uppercut because Santos has a lot of those uppercut hook, hook returns as well. Uh, but Blockowicz does those uppercut hook returns. Uh, he does them from the rear. Um, he does, he'll do he'll do them with his left-handed lead. You know, kind of like those shovel hooks. Um, he's got a really good jab. And uh, he is the better kicker. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's just... Uh, Glover essentially just has to walk through hell. Which I get it. That's what he's been doing. Like, what's he gonna do? What's yeah? What's Blockwitch gonna do with those tool dance? Knock Glover out? That just means Glover's gonna get Mountain Lynn and that fucking. I hope it happens again. I really do do. But I I don't know if it can happen against a guy who can actually wrestle and has has more veteran experience than than the past guys he's been doing it to. You know. So um, I'm gonna go with Blockwitch to get a, a knockout in the first two rounds. But if he doesn't, um, then I feel like this gets really live and, and gritty. Um, so whether you're betting Glover straight up, uh, Godspeed, um, or you're looking to live bet him, I think there could be something there too, especially if he survives the first fucking crazy uh, you know, uh, knockdown and, and sequence and, and the fight's able to settle or get to the next frame. Then you go and take that even bigger plus number, I'm guessing, on Glover. Um, I don't feel comfortable laying the chalk on Blakovich, but if you're going to play a prop, um, obviously I suggest the TKO prop. I think that's just the best angle as far as coverage and angles for Blakovich. Um, but uh, my heart's with Glover and Glover betters here, even though the pick is going to be Blakovich by second round uh, knockout. Um, hope it's. I hope I'm wrong. But that's the pick. Uh, next fight, co-main event, Peter Yan, minus 255. Corey Sanhagen, plus 210. Um, yeah, man, this is another one where I, I, 
I felt like I was going with Sanhagen the whole time. Like I kept seeing things, and then when I went to the Yon footage, I was like, ugh. No, I feel like I got the dynamic down. And it's not that the things I saw was wrong, by the way. Like, the Valley's on Sanhagen, so I'm rooting for Sanhagen. Uh, shouts to uh, one of his coaches there, I believe, uh, Sean Madden. It was his birthday recently. Um, I'm rooting for those dudes, rooting for anybody who bet on Sanhagen. There's value there, especially by KO. Um, essentially, it's, you know, Peter Yan is really relying on the high guard. That opens up body shots, which is going to be a two-way street. Uh, although I do love Peter Jan's check hook over the top when guys start hitting him to the body. He counters them really well. Um, and I think he's going to get the better of the leg department, so it's going to be another two-way street. But the shell department is bad for Jan, in the sense, and he, the fact that he dips is because uppercuts, uh, knees, both lifting and flying, are going to be there all day. And even the spin kick that uh, Sanhagen knocked out Marlon Marais with um, can be there with the way he holds his shell. It makes it hard to see those perifs of the spinning attack coming through, especially if the person correctly, as Sanhagen does, puts something in front of the spinning attack first. So even though Sanhagen was getting some craps, even from commentary and others, for maybe not going to be, you know, not being fundamental enough, his last fight, I think the Wilder stuff's actually going to serve him well in this fight. Um, and uh, yeah, literally anybody who's thrown knees. Like, Aljo landed, like, three in his fight, flying and otherwise. Uh, Jimmy Rivera even landed a knee to his head. Um, Jose Aldo landed a knee, a standing, a lifting knee. Like, I feel like anybody who's thrown a knee to Peter Jan's head has, has landed it. They just haven't landed it flush, a slash hard enough to really damage him, much less obviously stop him. Um, if anybody's landing the hard stopping knee, if I stop the knees, it's Peter Jan, folks. Let's be honest. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, but yeah, um, that's that's definitely gonna be there for Sanhagen. Like if Peter Yan just gets flattened, like you know, no one should be surprised. You know, if 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 he's just like the great Peter Yan gets flattened, you know, you get Nelson Muntz showing up, <laughs> like <laughs> it'll be so perfect. Um, and again, I'm picking Yan by decision here, but uh, I would not be mad at that at all. The problem is if Sanhagen doesn't knock Jan out or put a serious dent in his armor with damage within those first two rounds, uh, I think Jan, as he tends to do, not just build, but really smartly make his reads. Um, he'll, he's going to pull away. Pace, reads, diversity, counters, leg kicks are going to start paying off. And left hands seem to uh, hit Sanhagen the most. People have hit... Him with shifting ones, you know, obviously Jan and, and TJ share similar com combinations. Um, you know, the uh, throwing, you know, throwing the right cross, rolling under as they shift through to a left cross uh, from the opposite stance sorts of deals. He's been hit with those with punk left handed punctuations, uh, body work to head like Lin Lineker with the counters, l left hands up top. And as we know with Peter Jan, whether he's operating from orthodox or southpaw. That left hand really, really is his money. It's stupid, stupid accurate. Um, so I think that's going to be tagging him a lot too. And it's not that, you know, I, I further this is going to be a battle of builders, you know, especially with, you know, the, you read my breakdown and how I broke down Marais and, and Sanhagen, kind of like an Aldo. It felt like an Aldo Holloway. It just concluded much faster. Um, but it's not that I was wrong there, but when I went and looked at it, if you actually look back at San Hagen's round threes, except, except for his regional scene, which I think he's got two decision wins against relatively inexperienced guys early in his career that you could pretty much throw away. And of course the decision lost to Jamal Emmers, which I assumed knowing Jamal, uh, probably just wrestled him. I didn't watch that fight, but you look at it. It's not even so much a gas tank thing or anything like that. And I don't know if it's mental or what, uh, and I'm not trying to say that to insult Corey, because Corey even said himself last self fight, he got too content, kind of lost. And he does kind of get content with things. I think that's kind of the key word. And he kind of said so himself. Um, he said he, you know, worked on addressing it, you know, and and, and, and of course I would like to believe him, but you got you to gotta see things. We're not, we're not these fighters. We don't know. It's not personal against them. We just have to see, right? To go off evidence. It can be, you don't have to, it just can be very dangerous if you don't go off evidence. 
or at least base your theories off of some evidence, right? But when you look at it, um, it's weird because it's like he, the third round, things actually kind of get sketchy, which is, you know, I know he's got the Carlos Condit comparison, but round three, Carlos Condit was a motherfucker. Like, he wasn't necessarily finishing fights like a Yoel Romero or Brian Ortega, but Carlos Condit, whether it was like head-kicking GSP in a loss, um, getting momentum in Robbie Lawler, uh, you know, uh, or just uh, turning fights around in a win, um, that was kind of Condit's round. And you look at it, round three is where he just gives it away in his last fight, right? Um, after having a really good round two. Uh, where, where, you know, TJ technically won round one, but you see him limping. You're like, oh, the heel hook did damage. He gets the cut. And and, and it, just, it all seems to kind of start falling apart. And, and But Sanhagen lets him back in in round three. Um, and, you know... Everything else were quick knockouts or quick for him getting finished as well quickly until you go back to Rafael Sunsau. And I didn't rewatch that fight, but from what I remember is he hurts in Sunsau early. Um, and um, just like he was having a good success against John Lineker early, but then if you go back, uh, both those guys are having their best rounds in the third round. Lineker obviously winning the third round with Sagan and arguably, you know, having a argument to, to have won the fight, right? Um, and, yeah, those are his third rounds in the UFC. Other than that, he's never saw a third round win or lose. But the third rounds he has seen, that's where things kind of either started to fall apart uh, and fell apart or started to fall apart and was saved by the fight ending. This is going to be a five-rounder against a, a, a very good five-round fighter. Um, so, for me, the dynamic is is, you know... Unless Sanhagen, which is very possible, you know, maybe he just is set up here to be do the the, the TJ Burrell kind of a thing where he comes out and just has a master class, right? We haven't seen Jan deal with this type of length before, although the reach actually won't be that big of a difference. Jan has long reach for his size. Sanhagen, arguably, shorter reach for his length. Um, but uh, I do suspect that that length and size will give Jan problems early. Um, I just feel like he's got so much answers for it uh, with his head movement and footwork. Um, and, uh, and that's the thing is the footwork ultimately too. It's, it's cage positioning. Part of the reason I hate picking against Sanhagen, but when did I pick against him? Dillashaw and Sterling say what you will, but I was technically right on both those. And the reason why, even if you don't agree with the decision on the last one was because of cage positioning and, and Sanhagen, which is weird because I feel like in those a sunset, you know, there's a Sun Sao uh, Lineker fights, which I just kind of nitpicked. Like I feel like he had better cage positioning, not that he didn't move backwards, uh, but there were more instances of him pressuring. But when he went against grapplers or other people, like he was more kind of loose and willing to kind of give way, and it worked with Edgar in the small cage. Didn't work with Sterling, right? Um, didn't work with Dillashaw. They're gonna be in the big cage, thankfully, but. Still, that propensity to play on the outside against a guy with better footwork and just a guy who is best shouty is, is kind of corralling and really just doing his most menacing damage when he's able to corral in close uh, and get his opponents in between the, the inner black octagon lines and the octagon cage itself. So if Sanhagen's even going to just do half of that job for him by putting himself even just near it, I feel like Jan can push him in the rest of the way and win the cage positioning battle um, of this fight as well. So... Uh, again, you know, unless it's like a Barrow Dillashaw thing where he just comes out and just takes the steering wheel and, and never gives it back, um, I don't. I feel like Sanhagen has to win this fight early. Essentially, is the dynamic. Um, so you could play that as you will. I think overs and unders are. Let's see. What is uh? Um, yeah, it's that four and a half. It's tough because, again, this is one of those things where I feel like an under is almost a bet on Zanhagen. Not that Jan can't finish him. Um, but if he does, it's probably not going to be till rounds four or five. Kind of like an accumulative thing and just beating the crap out of him. And having the corner or a doctor maybe do it because Zanhagen's too damn tough. Um, so that's what. Kind of, so if you're going to you bet in the under, it's, why don't you bet on Zanhagen at a, at a better price? Although... Even his money line is coming down, so maybe you do take the under for plus money while it's still there if that's what you like. 
especially if you're more on the San Hagen side. Um, again, you're playing the law of average or law of numbers or whatever, probabilities. By the word I'm looking for, it's late. I'm sorry. Under four and a half in five-round fights. I have a, the widest coverage net as far as props go. Um, or a pretty darn wide, one of the wider coverage nets, I should say. But uh, I stayed away from all that. I, I honestly, I haven't touched these last two. You know, if I'm feeling, uh, you know, daring, I don't know. Honestly, honestly, I just, I, I, I'm going to enjoy these fights. I hate that my analysis has me on the opposite sides I want to be on. So I'm going to stay away, and I feel confident enough in what I'm going to give you guys on the rest of this card. Um, so we'll push through, shall we? Minus 700 favorite Islam Makhachev versus Dan Hooker, plus 450. Um, yeah, second time Hooker's making lightweight in 35 days. I don't like it, even though he looks good. All that travel around the world, flying around the world. Dan Huka, Dan Huka, Huka, Dan Huka, Huka. <laughs> I brutalize the New Zealand accent there. Um, shouts to my guy Dan from New Zealand. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I would love for Hooker to upset here. I'm going to pick Makachev. Um, I, I just like what I've been seeing, just seems to be getting bigger and more filled into his size. You know, uh, not as wafery and, and, and prone to the knockout that I felt like he was early in his career. He's a little more skinnier. Uh, the athleticism differential between him and Khabib was, was, was quite more apparent. <laughs> Maybe not as much now. I forget what game they were saying they were playing. And uh, the, he was saying, like, oh, I, I, Khabib used to beat me. Now I, he beats Khabib or something or something because uh, he's much heavier and he was trying to say it nicely. <laughs> Yeah, Khabib's definitely going in a Daddy Abdul Manap role. He earned it, goddammit. If anybody earns the, uh, the the dad bod there, Khabib has, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think I think Makachev uh, should roll here, but for that price, it's like... I would say it's a dogger pass, but... I actually put... um I actually have Makachev in my second tier of parlays for anybody interested in that. I know I get asked that between people asking my confidence level, people having confidence level plays to big parlays being the sub de jeu and uh, kind of always, right? It's, it's always fun to do. Um, I figure that could be just a, a good way to, to layer it. It ain't no, it ain't no PRP. Shout out to the master over there. Uh, C- uh, Cody Saftik and uh, uh, Paul over there on Dogger Pass podcast. Uh, those guys are the masters when it comes to that stuff. You, 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 you go there for those references, but um, uh, I'm just gonna give you guys uh, my weekly parlays that I do it over at Odds Checker US. But um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll I'll give you other, you know, what I'm also you know like the next lines that I'm confident in in case you like to switch out, add, however if you will, because again, you don't have to agree with me. I sure shit ain't telling you to. Um, I just try to offer a reference point to help you guys make some money, and hopefully we all can make some money together. Um. But yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, Makhachev here. He'll he'll be a a little second ad, as you'll see there. It'll be Khabib's boys for the second ad. But uh, next one we got Alexander Volkov minus two eighty. Uh, Marcin Tibur Tibur plus two forty. You know Tibur has quietly like went from a guy I thought was on his way out um, to you know really coming into his own, showing the promise that a lot of people thought when he came in. Although I picked and cashed Tim Johnson in his debut. Granted, that was a greasy ass split decision over in Zagreb. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I you know, Tabora's really been, you know, I've been on the wrong end of him. You know, maybe that's why I'm nervous about picking him, playing him here. Um, maybe I thought a little more money would come in on him, you know, to get his grappling going, but it's in the big cage. And, you know, I think we're seeing that gone is the truth. Uh, so maybe people are going easier on Volkov, even though it did feel like a weird fight from Volkov. I didn't rewatch it. Admittedly, I didn't tape this one. Wasn't interested in playing it. Um, uh, although I feel like Volkov, um, you know, I think he's going to be in a lot of parlays. I don't blame you if you're using him. I just, I don't know, maybe it's my PTSD from Tibur Tibur. Uh, but maybe he's getting on that Polish power energy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I see over 
uh, two and a half at minus one fifteen. I'm curious what it opened next. I don't think they're both minus one fifteen to open. Uh, I, I do wonder if uh, the over was plus money originally. No, it was minus two ten. No, that's that's not it. That's for Volkov. You stupid idiot, Dan. You idiot, Stimpy. You idiot, Stimpy. Uh, minus one ten is what it opened as. Minus one twenty. Okay. So yeah, minus one fifteen. Like you know, not much getting there. I feel like the over is probably probably would hit there to be honest. Um, yeah, that would be the only thing I would play to be honest. Be the over. Uh, if you put it in your parlays, good luck for Volkov because he's my pick. Um, Khamsat Shemaev, come shot Shemaev with all the freaking people just rubbing him off. Fucking you guys. I don't even know if this guy could barely... This guy probably could barely get to his weight cut. There's so many people lining off to polish this fucking poor guy off. Minus 650, uh, Li Jing Liang. Plus 425. Um, obviously, I picked uh, Chemayev, um for my staff picks. So I'll stick to that here. Um, you know, if, he's in, if, he, if, he, if COVID didn't affect him and he had a good weight cut, uh, my analysis would be that he can either get a decision or cook Lee if, if he doesn't knock him out in the first. But not only did I think that the knockout Lee, him lock, knocking out Lee round one would be my official pick anyways because uh, I have a feeling Ty is going to get it done, which is crazy because Lee Jing Lang's never been knocked out. Um, I just feel like he's been rocked a bunch, and the hype being what it is, I bet you he's going to be the first one to do it because this guy, Jemayev, can actually punch. Um you know, maybe that, that I bet you that's probably how it's going to be done, or he's going to hurt him and then get a submission and just get him in the first round. But now, when you look at it, it's like, oof, does he have to finish him in the first round? What's that gas tank going to be like with a really, really rough weight cut? He had to weigh in three times. Um, and uh, they're not going to have as much time to recover, I believe, either, with, with, with you know, uh, the way the, the weigh-ins go to the, uh, the time the fight starts, I believe. Or do they get extra time? I forget. How does that work? Oh, no, they get... Eh, yes and no. It's close. It's close to it's close to normal, but still. Um, that's not a good sign, you know, especially if you, you laid the chalk on Chemayev. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad for liking Chemayev or playing Chemayev. I just, you know how Dan Tom is when it comes to these overly hyped fighters or ridiculously hyped fighters, even if it ends up being deserved. They didn't necessarily deserve it yet. Um, and it's just, that's all I've been having to hear about. And somebody taught Jemayev how to say smash. And now they're like, oh, if we all say smish, they're all going to like us. And then everybody fucking parrots it and plays right fucking into it. Smash, 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 smash. Like, it's like, like, like everybody's turning into that gang of people that used to follow Scott Askham around. Yorkshire, Yorkshire, Yorkshire. Like, <laughs> And everybody's like, yeah, smash, smash, smash. Come shout over here. Shoot some my way. Everybody is just fucking just lining up just to suck off, suck them off, you know? It's just like, oh, my goodness, folks. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, anyway, you guys know how I feel about these fighters that just get the fucking suck off treatment. Like, easy. He's a good fighter. He deserves to be favored. I wish you the best if you played him. I'm picking him here. But do I have to, like, do I have to fucking, you know, do I have to give him a rusty trombone in between rounds? Do I have to, <laughs> like, do I, like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, just the, 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 oh, my God. I feel like I'm going to see that, that the, the, the Hamzat gifts on my just fucking timeline. Like, just seeing them nonstop. Like, oh, my goodness. Like, everybody is so fucking rock hard. Like, are, Are we betting on the guy, or are we swiping right on him? Like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> uh, and by the again, folks, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. You know I say this about every hyped fighter, regardless if I like them or not, if I pick them or not, if they're good or not, um, if my friends like them or not. Like, you know me. I'm going to, for better or worse, I'm going to say my honest opinion. And I'm usually going to go against the grain when it comes to this shit. Even when I'm picking, technically not going against the grain. You know, I'm I'm, I'm going to pick the guy, but I'm not going to suck his dick is what I'm saying. I, no, I know it disappoints. It might disappoint some of you. <laughs> 
But listen, um, you know, I, I think that uh, like, was it? you know, Chemayev round round one, round two. You, you play the rounds obviously because you're getting plus money on um, on the rounds if you're going to play him uh, for real. Um, but when before he actually missed weight, uh, just when he was late, I already kind of already uh, could see the writing on the walls. You know. Um, I think it was uh, one of the interviews I listened to. It might have been on unfiltered, oddly enough, because uh, I just I, I I will chase down where the fighter interviews are, uh, and um, they get, of course, their UFC podcast, so they get access. So I will uh, listen to them from time to time. And I think it was on that show where, um, yeah, he was talking about like he just sounded his low, kind of low energy, it sounded low energy with Aaron. Uh, shouts to my man Aaron B. I believe on the TSN MMA show. I believe that was an interview where he sounded super low energy, and then he was like complaining about food and being hungry, even though he wasn't even like asked about food. Um, it was just on his mind, and and I was like, oof, he is really sounds like he's really suffering right now. Um, you know, he, he I, I didn't I didn't think he was too long for 170 in the first place. Um, and and then he goes back there after his COVID and layoff. Like that was a really bad move. Shouts to uh, Shamat Karsandu and Simon Head uh, on the Brit Pack were saying similar things. Simon just reminded me there on Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, like that. Wh- why wouldn't you just do 185? That's that's pretty ridiculous. And um, you know he's still young. He's 27, but. Again, by the time they hit 30, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that as my concern, I think, for the last fight we'll talk about here. Um, fighters cutting big, making big weight cuts, and, and they're still doing it around 30 or, or later. That's when I really start to paying attention, and it might even weigh into my fades or not, right? If we're getting that close. If all damage is equal, we go to the second line of criteria, right? It's kind of like judging scoring, right? You don't want to make your, your picks or your, your, God forbid, your bets off, off these things, but... When things are kind of equal, you start looking at, you know, where are they at? They're still trying to make this weight at what age? Hmm. Going against a person with a better guess, thinking at a higher pace? Hmm. You know, when those things start to line up. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I know I believe Lee, like, the one time he did get submitted, I believe it was in third round. So he's he slipped up in third rounds too, but it's usually Lee getting, you know, messed up early in fights and almost finished and having to come back. Which is why I think you know Chimaev round one, and the odds reflect that is is most likely where it gets done for him. He's my official pick, but again, when um, uh, the, the cryptic tweet, uh, when um, he did miss and stuff um, before he, or before he even got the scale when he was going to be late, I went and I actually sprinkled a bit on Lee round three at plus thirty three hundred. That's a fucking stupid number. If it gets that far, I think he's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he's the one doing the ass kicking, you could be in worse shape from that, just from being tired from kicking his ass, plus COVID, plus weight cut. Um, you know, and Lee's got that. Uh, I'm trying not to use this word. <laughs> it was used toward me so much, but I've used this for Lee before. He's really got that R strength. He's that real, you know, that un, uh, intangible strength. <laughs> and I say this because one of the nicest human beings on this planet, um, <laughs> who's a pro fighter and trained with him. Uh, <laughs> Described it the same way. Like Lee just has this ridiculous strength, um, and uh, and late too, he carries it too. Um, so I sprinkled a little bit on that, uh, and and then a little bit on I think point seven unit. So like just a, a small little you know sprinkle. You don't sprinkle much for plus thirty three hundred. And then I did a point one seven unit in 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 one of my houses that offer an inside the distance for coverage, plus six thirty. Although I. I want to say uh, the, the knockout gun in my head is more likely than the submission, as his overall stats will tell you. Uh, but if you look, all the submission wins are like guillotines, and which again makes sense for a guy with 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 stupid strength and a stupid squeeze. Like, could you imagine he just guillotines a Kamsat? That would be fucking hilarious. So if you want to sprinkle on Lee for contrarian or to hedge out your parlays, just sprinkle a little bit to cover whatever you know y- y- you laid. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't hate using those plus six thirty and plus thirty three hundred neighborhood uh, props to do so. I think you'll get some decent coverage there. Or if you just want to sprinkle for fun and you stayed away from it altogether, like me, you could do that too. And uh, again, you know, point seven you, point one seven you, you're not really gonna miss those small amounts, um, especially if you're you're betting responsibly. 
Um, uh, but yeah, so that, that, that that's my take on that. Um, Magomed Ankalaev, Dagestani Stipe, minus 330. Volkan Uzdemir, plus 265. Um, yeah, man, I know he dropped the ball to Paul Craig, who has shown that he's no slouch, by the way. Uh, but I've, I've always been high on Magomed Ankalaev. You don't get many southpaws at this weight, much less athletic ones, much less ones that can wrestle, much less athletic ones that can wrestle, look like they can take a shot, and have a bit of the din mock themselves, whether it's in their standing shots or their ground and pound. Uh, so I like Shumayev. Uh, Uz- Uzdemir coming off a layoff. Um, doesn't look to have trained in the States at all since the pandemic. Uh, can't really find much on his socials or where he's training with. Usually smaller or lesser known guys when he does pop up on the field and um yeah he's technically two and one against ufc level southpaws but it's it's tricky you know i believe a grap another grappler southpaw was the one who gave him his first loss and kelly addinson um strong argument that osp actually did win that fight which was a short notice one uh, his debut uh, and then um he gets another southpaw victory after that. Of course, it's that really weird knockout, that really quick, fat flash, weird knockout against um, Misha Serkinov. Um, and as we've seen, you know, uh, that hasn't really aged well. And then after that, he's um, he's lost to southpaws, I believe. What was it to the, uh, the to Reyes? Even though you could argue that he won that fight. Uh, so it, it's tricky. Um, but the point is, is that Ankalaev looks like he could take a shot. He's got the wrestling to either ground him out and finish him there or control the fight there. And you can be sure shit he'll win on the scorecards. Um, or possibly knock Uzdemir out, whose chin has shown like you know, more and more that he can be uh he can be hurt and stopped in there too. So um I feel like Uncle Iev, it's hard to pinpoint, but with all those past the victory, I like him for a for a parlay piece. So he's in my main three. Amanda Hibash, minus 154. Verna Jandy, Handy Joba, shouts to Brass, uh, at Brass Chuck there. God damn it, got that name stuck in my fucking head. Janji Hoba. Jan, damn it, you guys know. Verna. Uh, plus, plus 130. I actually a big fan of Verna. <clears throat> she just seems just like, you know, there's that picture of her with her curly hair and holding the beer. It's like, how do you not love that? She just seems like good vibes. Um... You know, I uh, was happy for her for her last fight. But, uh, yeah, I feel like the jiu-jitsu cancels itself out. And Hibash throws more. Throws more diversely. I think her leg kicks are going to do her well. Uh, Verna does that in and out, which maybe could get her thinking twice. You know, her, her right hand's gotten a little better. But I, I don't think it's Marina Rodriguez level, you know. I think that Hibash can either work past the PTSD and push through to the clinch, where she will be the better clinch fighter. Uh, they're both Brazilian jiu-jitsu Accolades in the gi are better from top than bottom, though capable of finishing from bottom. Uh, but I believe Amanda Hibosh, perhaps because she also has a judo black belt and some judo team accolades, her wrestling overall in MMA seems to be better. Uh, so from her clinch work to her wrestling, um, I like that better. And her grappling uh, when she's on the ground on top, she'll actually settle and strike, whereas that's the thing with Verna Jin, uh with Verna, she um, whether she's on bottom working or on top, there's not a lot of strikes there, um, and I don't think either are going to submit the other girl. And with effective grappling being incredibly subjective, and you know, most feeling like you almost got to pretty much get a submission in, or just like unquestionably dominant. You know, it, it's really tough to convince people with effective grappling. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Is that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to go with a person who doesn't strike and is not as good of a wrestler or not as good at judo, um, not as strong in the clinch. Uh, so I like Hibosh there. Uh, I think she's going to land more. And without the knockout threat being on the table and with it, you know, her taking almost a year off to recover the chin a bit, you know, and get her confidence, uh, you know, her, her mind right and her body right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like I like Hibosh here. Uh, I actually went with the decision prop because I just think they're going to cancel each other out uh, in that regard. And this just feels like a uh, a, a layup in that sense. You know, um, Murata, Kaneko, uh, who she fought last time, didn't really have a striking game. She was undersized. And if you look at it, it looks like she threw out her own shoulder on like one of the first punches in the second round. 
So, and she looks like an atom weight, yeah. So I was like, I don't know. I don't know how much of a weight to put into that. Um, and not trying to do the Mackenzie Dern math, but there's that too, right? You know? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Hibosh by decision. I got it like plus 125 at one house and plus 105 at the other. Um, so I listed it at plus 105 here and in my article because, you know me, I, I will take the... Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm the opposite of most dudes. Uh, I, I'll, I'll go with lower average than round up. <laughs> Because I'm secure like that. Uh, but yeah, I took, I was just say plus 105, even though I also got it at plus 125. Uh, I just threw a unit on that. Um, it's one of my more confident props, along with one coming up in two fights. Not the next fight, though. Uh, Zubaira Tuhugov. Tuhugov. Minus 168, Ricardo Hamosh, plus 142. Um, Hamosh looks kind of fancy, but feels like, always feels like he could potentially fall apart. Um, Tuhugov has a really good left hook, some good wrestling, scrambling, but it just doesn't have a process that I, you can still feel confident on despite him seemingly being around forever and training with high level guys forever. I can't remember the Akeem Duwodu fight offhand. I, I'm, I probably picked him, but I'm, I'm sure it wasn't confident. Uh, whereas, uh, Hamosh, you know, defeated Bill Algio. I can't remember that fight, but I'm, I'm, I, I probably was on the wrong side of it because I, haven't been impressed by uh, Ricardo Hamosh, and then he beats a guy like Bill Aljo who can put a pace on. So, um, obviously, he can still surprise me as he's growing into this weight class, as he came up from 35. Probably more natural for him to be fighting at 145. Uh, but I'll go with Zabayar Tuhugov. If he can't get finished, he'll probably get a gift from the judges or a draw at worst. Um, shoot. Maybe this is a fight where, like, yeah, you, like, I wonder if you get, like, a draw or something here if you want to sprinkle a little bit on that. Eh, nah, I don't really see the dynamic aside from something really, like, stupid and screwy. Um, but, yeah, I went with uh, Tuhuga for my pick. I'll stick with it. No plays. Uh, next fight, Albert Durayev. Albert Durex, minus 350. Uh... Roman Kapilov, plus 280. Um, I took Durayev here. He is the second leg of the parlay. And I also sprinkled it in by submission because uh, not just Kapilov getting subbed by Carl Roberson, but uh, Kapilov getting subbed by Carl Roberson. Who am I kidding? Um, no, but, like, yeah, obviously a guy like Durayev who's actually, oddly enough, he's, he's coming off that big layoff for a while. But now, he, you know, he turns around, gets the winning contender series, and now he's actually the more active party uh, compared to Kopilov, who's been off for, like, almost over two years. And they called him up on short notice to take this fight. Like, oof, yeah, I don't like that. Whereas Duraya has been active. He trains with good guys in Europe. He trains with the good guys here in the States, in Las Vegas. Um, it's been, you know, extreme couture, et cetera. Um, like the wrestling base. Uh, he's been able to get late finishes, even like fifth round finishes before. The guy's been proven. He's been on my radar since he fought uh, Vasily Veshelev. I forget how to pronounce that name. But um, back on the Russian regionals. Um, and Kopilov's more of a southpaw striker. He's all his stuff's in like Russian hand to hand. No grappling accolades and uh, vacant takedown defense. Doesn't look like he's training with any big bodies. Any uh, anyone super notable um, on his Instagram? Nothing like that. Looks like he stays in shape. You know, he's he's getting bigger. Russian Chase Hooper, but he looks like Russian Chase Hooper. Uh, I'm gonna go with Durayev here by submission. Uh, I played submission by plus one forty five, um, and uh, and uh, I did that for just point seven five unit, um, three quarter unit. Uh, so there's that. Um, next fight. Uh, Elizu Zaleski de Santos minus 210 uh, it's Benoit Saint Denis uh, plus 176 um, I think there's something funny in his profile this guy's like an SAS guy like a SAS operator I like playing as them in Counter Strike um, but he likes to fight in the clinch and grapple a lot uh, most of his wins are by submission but again de Santos me you know, have pace lulls, but he he's not a guy who really has a, a terrible gas tank. He's got a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. I know his wrestling's not the best in the world, but he scrambles really well. Um, he's, in, he's in a lot of scrambly fights. Um, look at this noise saying to me, guys. Uh, profile. There's something 
opportunity. I have a scientific high school certificate. French national BJJ champ. I was in the military. The God of War. Started in 2017. Uh, for fun, to be a better SAS operator, I ended up falling in love with fighting. Um. Oh yeah, here it is. Do you have any heroes? Napoleon. Napoleon is his hero. Um, he's listed at 5'11". I don't think he's 5'11". I think he's a little shorter. Southpaw. But, um... Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I'm i going to go with uh, DeSantos. Feels like it should be... A layup. He should find the finish somewhere in there. You know, this guy's uh, fighting on somewhat short notice, I believe. Didn't he? Uh, and again, I know DeSantos has looked bad in his recent fights, but he's really experienced. Um, you know, looks in, he always looks in good shape, and he always looks serious. So I don't know. I don't know what it is. Feels like uh, I don't know what I'm missing here, but it uh, feels like he should roll. I just didn't find an angle um, that I was confident in, and I didn't want to play him straight up at minus 210, although that is slightly lower than his minus 225 opener. Um, inside the distance is plus uh, 110, I think, if you can find that anywhere. That, that's probably not bad. That's not a bad bet if you can find that. Uh, but I didn't officially play anything, but the pick is DeSantos. He would be like third tier. Um, the Brazilian tier with Hibosh. We'll get to that. Um, Shamil Gamzatov, minus 118. Uh, Michal Oleksajic, uh, plus 100. Um, if you can find him at plus money, uh, uh, you know. Uh, I feel like he's a, a more popular dog shot. Um, I picked Gamzatov, so I'll... Well, I picked Gamzatov, but, like, staff picks don't show up, and I feel like I'm fucking beholden to those things, and they've already fucking dictated enough of my goddamn schedule and psyche. Fuck that. I'm going to go with Mikhail Oleksajuk. I didn't play him. I'm not saying you should play him. I actually saw him at plus money, and I passed, to be honest. Uh, I'm not that confident in him um, to do it here. I just, I'm not confident in Sh Shmuel Gamzatov. I studied him for the first PFL season and just was not impressed, like watching the fights with like Rex Harris and so forth. Um, I can't remember the clits and Abreu, a lot of it. I just remember I wasn't impressed and that it hasn't aged well. Uh, and Oleg Sajic has really thrown me off. He's shown like to be the guy that can gas people. If you want to pick an undersized guy who works the body, but then he showed to be gassed and like drop off the face of the earth. And then like, you know, he wins a fight that you could argue he lost. He didn't have the, exactly the best, most convincing pace that you would like to see out of him, especially against a big lumbering guy like uh, Gamzatov, um, who is a wrestler but doesn't have the most reliably, doesn't reliably go to his wrestling. Uh, or perhaps because there's not much there. You, you would rather strike it out and come forward. Um, but yeah, um, picking Oleg Sejic reluctantly. Good luck if you played him. If I do, it's like to sprinkle on him for fun or something because something fell apart early. I don't know. But I don't know what else I would be on because I think the only thing left is the last leg, which will be the first leg. Uh, it's the third leg, which will be the first leg, but the third leg with how we're getting to it in this podcast. Lerone Murphy will be that third leg, minus 330. Uh, Makwan Amir, Amir Honey, uh, plus 265. I wasn't sure about this one because I didn't want to uh, sweat those moments. It's like... Okay, Murphy has fought crazy tough competition. Um, if you, if you consider just kind of experience level and 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 whatnot in a certain context, um, and like he should roll against Makwan, but then part of me is like, well, he does, you know, he you know he will, you know, like I think he th messed up on a throw and like got mounted by like uh, Douglas De Silva de Andrade, who's not known as a grappler, although he's, I think he's got ranks some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but obviously he's mainly a Muay Thai guy. Um, you're like, ooh, oh crap. But if you think about it, like, he scrambles really well out of those positions, and his defense is really good. Like, no one's even getting close. His hand positioning, like, his wherewithal is really good. And Amir Khani is not as game over as we thought. You know, you look at the guys he subbed, they were either gassed or, or like, a, a fish gold. Who actually is, you know, decent experience, Cage Warriors, Cage Warriors champ, I believe. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt and, and competent, more than competent, obviously, with submissions, but had more of a gas tank issue, uh, which was worse than Amir Khani's. Um, and, uh, you know, 
even Amir Khani, who is more experienced than Murphy as a fighter, more experienced as a UFC fighter, better wrestler, more experienced wrestler, actually an accoladed wrestler, even Amir Khani in his last goddamn fight threw himself into a mount. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> both these guys will make somewhat questionable decisions. The difference is Murphy um, fights out of them immediately and more efficiently, uh, more powerfully, more urgently, more smartly. And he doesn't he doesn't show to tire. Um, he's been in hard fights like his last fight or his fight with uh, Zabiro Tuhugov, which by the way that's like I think that was short notice UFC debut, and that was that Abu Dhabi card where it was outdoor and like where the mat was burning people physically, and everybody was gassed because it was just like a hundred and like twenty degrees on the mat. So like the fact that he was a little tired in that, like yeah, you, you got to cut him some slack in that. Um, I you know uh, I, I, some, there are certain moments where maybe you could criticize Murphy for maybe not doing enough because he does I, I do think he has the gas tank. Uh, however, against a guy like Amir Khani, he's not gonna have to worry about that. A guy who doesn't put the numbers out striking even when he is fresh, um, who relies on his striking too much. His striking is not developed well. Um, he's just like basic check hook left hand stuff. Um, I think Murphy is going to be able to chew up his legs if he wants to, his calves. He's really good calf kicks, good counters, uh, just good hand positioning. Um, and, and yeah, just Amir Khani's gas tank. He's not even training with SBG now, which maybe is a better thing, but I do not recognize any of the, the coaches or people he's training with. Maybe that's great for his confidence, but I feel like uh, Murphy is going to be is going to fit the trend as far as wins and losses. Because I, you know, I like many um, are pretty high on Murphy. Uh, I, I just still worry that he could get his prospect loss, and those are usually by submission. And again, a better wrestler than him, somebody who can wrestle and go for submissions, that's their specialty. You could maybe make that contrarian argument that Maquan's actually quietly the guy here. Maybe that's what I was worried about. But despite the fact that Maquan is going to get some takedowns early in this fight, and all of us holding any kind of a Murphy ticket in our hand are going to be sweating. I do think he gets past that like he did with Ricardo Hamosh, who also at a, once upon a time looked like he could be game over from the back too, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with with Murphy here, and Hamosh at least is younger in age and in his career than a guy like Maquan, where I think Maquan is pretty much who Maquan is at this point. You know, he's been in the UFC for, what, almost seven years now? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go with Murphy here. So you have Murphy, Ankalaev. Murphy, minus 310. Ankalaev, 305. Uh, Derive, minus 350 for plus 125. I actually got this at plus, as high as plus 140 at some houses. Um, but, of course, I'm giving you guys the lowest um, average to just be, be realistic, and, as realistic and transparent as possible. Um. So, yeah, that's that. Uh, the rest of this card, uh, I was thinking about Petrovsky, but it was more just a fade on, on huge Yao Zong. Huge Zog. Like piece of huge Zog. Trump? People think I don't like the Chinese, but I actually like huge Zog. Um, but, uh, you know, despite uh, huge Zong being huge and cutting down a middleweight, I, I, who knows? He could have made improvements. He actually looked like he could be a better striker than Petrovsky. He like do the Dutchie combo. Um, and he has stupid durability, whereas Petrovsky, even though he looks like he's improving this cardio, um, the dude's counterable for days, and uh, I just, I don't know if I can bet a guy at that much chalk, much less parlay a guy at that chalk, who you got to worry about himself sabotaging with his own gas tank. Now, he was able to push through that barrier, seem confident as all hell, and good, good on him. More power to you, brother, but... Uh, I don't know if I can trust trust to lay the chalk. I might regret this. You know, I think Petrovsky by sub is how you, you want to play it because, again, a guy who's going to take Huge Zong down and take him down is going to be the best bet because he looked like he had no answers when he was turtled. Granted, that fight with uh, Cyril Asker um, was like back in 2017. He still made Cyril Asker look like a Division One wrestler, which is a problem. Um, so... Against an actual Division One wrestler, uh, you know, whose dad, uh, whose dad, uh, he just said his dad coached at um, 
Penn State. And I was like, wait, was he the child molester? Well, that's Sandusky, not Petrovsky. I was going to say, like, no wonder why he wasn't specific. Uh, but, sorry, Sandusky was a football coach anyways. What the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> Jesus, dude. <laughs> Hi, this is Jerry Sandusky, and you're listening to the Protect Your Neck Podcast. Hi, this is Jared Fogle, and you're listening to the Protect Your Neck Podcast. Jesus Christ, why are they all sex offenders? Uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus, no one cut that out, please. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go with the fuck. Yeah, I'm going to go with Petrosky by um, second round sub. Um, I may sprinkle on it for fun, depending on what the round props are. There's, there's none out right now in the houses I'm at. I was going to look for that. Um, and I was also going to look for a, a one at the end here, which we'll get to, uh, possibly for a fun sprinkle. I'm glad I let this guy off. Uh, I was considering him, too, which was Demir Ismagulov. I don't know, dude, but our fight's off because uh, Ismagulov was uh, uh, seven pounds off from the scale off. Wow, Dan. Sorry, folks. That's late. Um, so that fight's off, um, which means uh, you know Javier Bardem. Uh, from No Country for Old Men, uh, <laughs> we'll have nobody to fight. Magomed Mustafaev. Uh, posted from his profile, like apparently he's studying. Like, where's this guy been for, for since he fought Brad Riddell? Apparently he's studying to become a second grade PE teacher. Like, can you imagine that fucking scary guy? You know, as your second grade today, we play dodgeball, but with bullets. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to do that. <clears throat> Uh, like glorifying the Russian thing, the Dagestani thing, but you know, the guy looks like a tough, scary motherfucker. What can I say, folks? <laughs> All right, <laughs> forgive me. Uh, lastly, but not leastly, Tajir Ulambekov, minus 390. Alan Nascimento, plus 310. This is really weird because you got one guy who's like Khabib's dude, so he's got that hype, but he actually doesn't have any master of sports in anything. He was just like a skinny kid. It sounds like he grew up in the neighborhood and like was training with Khabib since he was like 13 or 14 years old and since they were kids. Um, and he, you know, wrestles very much like that. He's, uh, uh, I see some um, Abubakar, to be honest, with the takedowns. A lot of maybe because it's the, the length kind of parody there um, with, with the body locks, the long step arounds, the wraps, the corner turns, certain styles of the takedown. Again, these are all Abdul Manab students, so you're gonna see a lot of crossovers, right? It's not it's not coincidence. Um, but he looks to be pretty good. He's got, you know, good jabs and some good counters, some decent kicks, but his defense isn't great, probably because he's just super tall. And there's a lot to hit there, right? Um and, but I do wonder how he's gonna do against Alan Nascimento. Um Nascimento you know, uh, he he already has experience fighting a tall flyweight and Holly and Paiva, which he lost a split. Um, I scored it for Paiva. I could see a little bit more the second time how a judge could have scored it for Nascimento. Uh, Nascimento did land some good leg kicks against a longer opponent. That's going to be something here, especially if you saw Ulan Bekoff's last fight, even two fights. I don't know if his last two fights, but two of the fights that I watched for sure, um, I could see the leg. It's something that's been there, uh, availability. Um, Nascimento, of course, comes from Shootbox, Diego Lima. So he definitely has that style, but even though his kicks are more powerful than his punches, which makes sense because the, the guy actually comes from a soccer background, he is not the Alan Nascimento, uh, I, you know, uh, accoladed grappler from like the late aughts that you will find on BJJ Heroes. That's a different person. Um, this guy used to play soccer. I think he's only like a, a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He, like, he just got it, but he's. Got a lot of submission finishes. He's like one of those, again, speaking of shootbox Diego Lima, Charles Dubronz. I think he's also trains with Macaco Gold Team there. Um, and, you know, I know Dubronx is a black belt now, but Dubronx, even when he was getting a bevy of submissions for the first, like, half of his UFC stretch, he was, like, still a purple belt and some shit. So I think he's, like, maybe one of those purple belts. Like, he's got a lot of different kinds of submissions. Uh, I just don't think he's going to be able to sub Ulan Beck off. And if he can't get the leg kick stoppage, I don't think he's going to knock him out. He doesn't seem to have that power. It's also coming off of a layoff. Um, hasn't made... It's weird. It's like Nascimento, it's like, I want to fade him too because like both these guys look like they should be having trouble um, making flyweight soon because they're both 30 years old and they're both really tall for the division. So expect it to start showing in their game soon. I would expect it to show with Nascimento first because even though they're the same age, he's been fighting longer with more miles and he hasn't 
he's only fought once in, in the last three years and hasn't made the weight in since 2018 because his one fight in the last three years that he's coming off of was actually at 135 on the regionals. He hasn't really fought anybody good. Um, not that, you know, Tajir Olambekov's record's crazy, but uh, he fought really good people at Fight Nights Global. And if you look at his loss, um, I've talked about this here before in the podcast when breaking down uh, Kazakh Jim Norton, Zhaugas Zhumagulov. Um, when I reference Zhumagulov's many fights that he were really questionable, um, this was the most questionable one. Like, I maybe gave one, maybe two rounds, depending on how you view things, to uh, Zhaugas. Uh, I don't know where it was. I, you would like to think it was in Russia, but maybe it was in Zhaugas' home country in, in Kazakhstan. But like, it just felt like a such a fix, a home fixing that you see on on the more regional shows. Um, so Tajir Olenbekov should be undefeated. However, I didn't remember maybe because I had no action on it. But when I went back to watch that fight with Bruno Silva, and I know Bruno Silva is is, is much better than his record uh, leads on. Um. That fight was much closer than I realized. I also didn't like how Tajir Olenbekov's um, wrestling defense. Is not Sometimes he looks caught off guard, but Bruno Silva trains with wrestlers and is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, I believe, in his own right. So it's like he shouldn't have been off guard there. I don't like how uh, how much of a difference I saw in Tajir's wrestling defense as opposed to his offense. His offense is fine, but his defense, I, I didn't like it. Even if it was lackadaisical and laziness, I didn't like that he was that lackadaisical and lazy. To get put in those positions, regardless or not or whether he scrambled fast, which he did, and he scrambles really well out of positions, by the way, um, which is why I think he's going to roll here. But between the 390 and the fact that, again, you think that it, the weight thing would be on Nascimento more? Well, I went to Nascimento's Instagram, and like the day before the weigh-ins, he was already on weight at least according to my translation from kilogram to pounds, I think it showed 57 kg on the scale, and that was like 125 pounds or something. I was like, damn, this guy, you know, he looks in great shape. Um, so basically, I just think it's going to be a closer fight than it realizes where, like, Massimento will have a, a a real argument for winning, but with it being where it's at, and you don't have to play that tinfoil hat game, but, you know, Let's be honest, folks. You know, uh, I mentioned this before with some of the scorecards, although that didn't really prove to be true through the overall sample. Um, I don't know, man. I'm going to convey the dudes. Um, I like to think he's got some kind of edge on the scorecard, uh, which I feel like he did, too, because I feel like there was an argument for, there's definitely an argument for Bruno Silva winning that fight. So maybe it's just a little bit of PTSD from that last fight. But, um,. I'm going to go with Ulam Bekoff here, and the decision prop isn't out in any of my houses, but let's see what it's listing at on best fight odds if it is. Ulam Bekoff to win by decision plus 100. If you can still get a plus number on that, that's probably worth a sprinkle to start your night. Um, I may sprinkle on that, and uh, what was the other one I may be looking at? Petrovsky sub slash round two maybe or something. Um, but nothing official yet. That's that's definitely what I'm going to be looking for when those drop. So you guys know. All right. Uh, recapping picks and plays. How do we do on time? That's a little bit long. 123, Jason. Well, it was a 15 fight card, so what the fuck are you going to do? All right. Um, taking Blakovich over to Shero. My heart's with Glover. Glover's garage. Uh, taking Jan over Sanhagen. Watch out for that flying knee. Hearts with Sanhagen. Uh, taking Makhachev over Hooker. Taking Volkov over Tibura. Taking... Come shot Shemayev over Li Jing Liang. Uh, taking Magomed Ankalaev Dagestani Stipe over Uzdemir. Taking Hibash over Henji Joba. Taking Hamosh over Tuhugov. Or taking Tuhugov over Hamosh. Taking Durayev over Kapilov. Taking Saint Din. Uh, taking. Uh, Easy Dos Santos, shout out to the co Event Podcast, over Benoit Saint-Denis. Taking Mikhail Oleksajuk over Shamil Gamzatov. Um, taking Mahwan, or taking Lerone Murphy over Mahwan Amirhani. Taking Andre Petrosky over Hirzak. Taking... <laughs> 
I did take Uzmai Gulov over Mustafaev, though I probably would have switched that pick after the weigh-ins. That fight's not happening. Taking Ulam Bekov over Nascimento. I parlayed Durayev, Ankalaev, and Murphy for plus 125. If you want to add Khabib's boys, which is Islam and Tajir, to that for a five leg, that'll turn it into plus 230. And if you want to go for a lucky number seven, you go with Brazil, adding Hibosh and Easy Dos Santos for plus 657 if you if you dare venture any of those deals. But that's kind of my confidence lean. I'm really just laying hard. Uh, I did lay that in one house. Um, I'm going to lay it much smaller in another because, as you might have seen my tweet, bet online for whatever reason doubles my plays randomly. And I've had them corrected before, and then they said they wouldn't fix it anymore after this last one, even though it's their fucking fault. So I'm not even going to stress it because I part of me was thinking about laying two units anyways with this kind of a layered deal. So I ended up laying two units in one house anyways. But it's it's the main one is Durayev, Ankalaev, Murphy, plus 125. No straight plays. Again, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I sprinkle on Oleksayshuk if, uh, you know, the sprinkle, if I do late sprinkles on Ellen Beckoff by decision or Petrosky by submission round two. One of, one of those hit. We've got a little extra money to play with early. Maybe I sprinkle there, but no straight plays. The props are Hebosh by decision plus 105 at one unit. Got a plus 125 in another house. Followed by Durayev by sub plus 145.75 units. And with the weigh-in debacles, I did do a little bit of sprinkles on Lee round three plus 3,300. Lee inside the distance plus 630. Of course, my official pick is come shut your Relax. Don't come out my with pitchforks. All you Hamzat fanboys there. Um, but Hamzat round one, I think, is probably for you betters or fanboys alike that want to make some money on on on. on Chimaev, uh, that round one's got to be it for him, I think. Me thinks. Um, and if you're not as exposed on Durayev but are looking away to play it, maybe Durayev Kapilov under because he only gets finished by knockout early, though Kapilov only has one knockout in round one despite having a 100% finish rate. I don't know. I would probably stay away from that um, and just listen to what I said previously on that. But those are the picks and plays. I wish you guys the best of the luck. Expedited this as fast as I fucking could. It's contract season. There's just way too many fucking fights to talk about. It's fucking ridiculous. You just got to pick your spots and hope for the best. I wish you guys the best because if you're doing good, hopefully that means I'm doing good too. I would like us all to do well. Good luck in your picks and plays. Have an awesome Halloween. And always protect your neck.